in 1946, the race riot in Columbia, Tennessee, was a phenomenon that begins to talk, speak to the militancy of black veterans and the black community coming out of that Second World War. What happened is, it, you know, and many of these things start off as something really simple. What happened was a woman named Gladys Stevenson, a black woman, wanted to get her radio repaired. She took it to a shop. The guy told her it was going to cost so much to get it fixed, and it, and it would be done by such and such a date. She goes back to pick it up. He tells her it's going to cost more. She's like, I don't have that kind of money. He's like, yeah, it bees that way sometimes. And so they go back and forth, back and forth. Then he sells her radio, and then she, he tells her it's going to cost more for her to get it back from the guy that he just sold it to. Next time she comes in, she comes in with her son who's a Navy veteran, because when she gets the radio, it doesn't work. He's cut off the electric cord and the batteries don't work. And he's charged her a double the price that he originally said it was going to cost. They get into a, a heated argument. In this heated argument, it looks like somebody, one of the assistants is getting ready to smack the woman. You know, and this veteran, and let me be real clear, this veteran used to box. This veteran was not going to let somebody smack his mother. And he steps in between. And the fact that you have a black man in Tennessee in 1946 basically stepping up saying, oh, no, you are not going to lay your hands on my mother. Come on, Ma, let's go. And so she's walking out. The son is walking out. The man is so angry. He and he hits the veteran in the back of the head. Now, veteran doesn't go down. Veteran turns around and it's like, oh, snap, bam! And the battle is on. He's pounding him, pounding him, pounding him. They go through a glass window. This is 1946. You get a black man hitting a white man going through a glass window. As they go through the glass window of the, of the radio shop, whites are around looking going, what, what is this? What, what is this? And so a few more whites go in there to try to beat on the veteran because I'm like, my God, you've got a black man hitting a white man. This is absolutely criminal. Well, when the mother sees folks attacking her son, She's like, oh, that's my baby boy. Now you may be, that's my baby boy. She comes after him with, she picks up one of those shards of glass and she starts slashing. They both get pounded. They both get arrested. And the lynch mob is like, oh, uh-uh, uh-uh. We're, we're going to have to do something here. You know, these folks have gotten a little too uppity. Who do they think they are? Talking back and hit you see what they did to poor Bo over there? Oh, that, that, unacceptable, unacceptable. And you start getting this milling around of the crowd around the jail. Well, the black community hears about, sees the milling around, starts hearing the word, we're gonna get a rope, we're gonna get a rope, we're gonna get a rope. And they start moving, they, they work to get the son and the mother out of Columbia, Tennessee. The lynch mob is coming. Black folks start organizing because one of the things, I mean, we think of like Martin Luther King and nonviolence, but one of the things is that there has been a tradition in the black community of self-defense. And so what they do is they get their shotguns, because remember, this is the South, everybody's got a gun. They get their shotguns, they get their rifles, they get their pistols, and they start taking a purchase on top of the buildings in the black community, the area known as the bottoms or mink slide. And so as whites start pour, pour, pouring in, and there was one guy, he, had a, uh, he was just going to burn down the black businesses. So it reminds you of Tulsa, going to burn down the black businesses. And he comes in there with a, his buddies and a can of gasoline, and he starts trying to zigzag and pour the gasoline. And all of a sudden, the, the, the black guys on top of the roof start shooting. Bam! Bam! It's like, did black folks just shoot at white folks? Did we just get shot? Wait a minute. Did I just, I, I'm wounded. I just got shot. What? What? So they, the, the wounded whites get pulled out. And it's like, oh my God, what are we going to do? What are we going to? And the crowd is coming. The crowd is coming. 
Now the sheriff is first in there going, okay boys, now you just need to settle down. We'll, we'll handle this. And the crowd is like, no, no, no. Call in the Tennessee National Guard, uh, the Tennessee State Guard. They, as they're coming in, as more whites of the mob are coming in, black folks are defending their property because there had been lynchings in that county before. They knew what this looked like. And this is 1946. You had veterans up on those roofs. They had taken down the Nazis. They weren't having it. For them, this was a new day. And even though they had been systematically cut out of the GI Bill, and, 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 and part of that, let me, let me describe that piece, being cut out of the GI Bill, it was passed in 1944, and it opened up a range of opportunities to veterans. It opened up housing opportunities, so through the VA loans. It opened up uh, education, so it a full ride through college for veterans. But the way that the law was written was that although it's a federal law and it's written race neutral, in the language is that, that it will be administered by the states. And so when you're looking at these Jim Crow states that cannot fathom that a black man should have access to education, what you're getting are these veterans who are watching these opportunities pass them by. And the, the thing that they're going to do at the bare minimum is to protect their homestead, to protect their community, and to protect one of theirs. And so as whites are coming in, these veterans are shooting back. So when the sun comes up, the state troopers move in, and I mean they moved in with machine guns, moved in and started rounding up. Uh, they call you, 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 you were brave last night, are you brave this morning? Because we're getting ready to take you down. At the very end, you get beatings, shootings. About 25 African Americans are arrested for attempted murder. Now, I see self-defense. What? Tennessee saw was attempted murder for shooting at the guys who were trying to burn down the black neighborhood, for shooting at the mob that is trying to go in and destroy the black neighborhood. Well, these Tennessee stormtroopers basically did that as they went rummaging through these, the, the, the black business section, looking for the guns, looking for the rifles. Well, they weren't finding too much. And none of the ballistics were matching up. But in the trial that happened, in the trial that happened, I mean, the trial itself becomes fascinating. Because as the lynch mob is forming and as it's very clear that the bullets are flying, somebody calls into Nashville and says, alert the NAACP. We're in trouble down here. The NAACP then sends its attorneys to help these 25 black men who have now been arrested for attempted murder, charged, indicted for attempted murder. The defense was absolutely brilliant. I mean brilliant. Z. Alexander Luby, who was the black attorney out of Nashville, one of the first things he did was to begin to challenge the jury. You know, what they call that voir dire process, where it's like, do you have any biases against black folks? Do you really think that you can be uh, um, fair and impartial? No. Next. <laughs> Do you really? Next. Are you a member of the Klan? Well, yeah. Next. I mean, and so to find them, <laughs> you, 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 you can't make this stuff up. So by the time they were able to get 12 jurors who, who could be impartial and then because the state's case was so weak, they didn't have the evidence. And Z. Alexander Luby is arguing, this is self-defense. This is one of the basic rights that we know of as Americans. We honor this, we cherish this. In the first round, 23 of the 25 men were found not guilty. Yeah. Now you had the other two. Thurgood Marshall from the head office of the NAACP comes down to take part in this case of, for the final two. They again laid out a brilliant, beautiful strategy. It so infuriated the law enforcement folks in Columbia, Tennessee, that what they did was after the end of, of the trial, 
Z. Alexander Luby, uh, Thurgood Marshall, who would become the first black Supreme Court Justice of the United States, and two other men are in a car, and they're leaving Columbia. And they're like, whew, man, that was, you know, almost like, yeah, that was bad, yeah, okay, this is good. Cops pull them over. Well, they think it was the cops because they were in plain clothes and the cars were unmarked. But when you get that kind of, they're close behind you, so they pulled over. First thing they did was they're, they're looking in the car for, for open containers, convinced that somebody's been drinking. They went and bought some Coca-Cola at the local store, but they, they weren't drinking hard liquor. There's no booze in the car. So cops like, get in the car, oh man, didn't find any moonshine, didn't find any wine, didn't find any whiskey. Mm. They drive a little bit further, cops pull them over again. Let's see your, let's see your license, they ask Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall hands over his license. Man, it's not expired. There's nothing wrong with this license, I mean, there's nothing we can get him on. <laughs> gets his license back, drives a little bit further. Then cops pull him over a third time. In this third time, they're like, you're driving drunk. It's like, I've had some water and I've had some Coca-Cola. Yeah, you look drunk to me. Get out of the car. They pull Thurgood Marshall out of the car throw him into their car. Now, there's a white guy in the car named Harry Raymond. And he looks up and he's like, wait a minute. They're not going back to, to the city to arraign him or to arrest him or anything like that. They're driving off into the woods. So he hops over and he starts following the cars that have Thurgood Marshall in them. They look up, they turn right, he turns right. They turn left, he turns left. They slow down, he slows down. They speed up, he speeds up. And he's thinking, they're gonna lynch him. They're taking him off into the woods to lynch him. They're gonna lynch Thurgood Marshall. My God, they're gonna lynch Thurgood Marshall. Finally, they turn this way, he turns this way. They stop the car, he stops the car. He gets up, they're like, what are you doing? Cops are, what are you doing? And he's like, I know what you're planning, and I'm not going to let you do it. They said, what? What? He said, I know what you're planning. And you begin to think about this. You really have no backup. I mean, you are out here in the woods in Tennessee. You are dealing with men who are strapped. They have guns. You don't. This is nothing but the sheer raw courage of principle and doing what I'm not going to let you do it. They're like, fine, here. When they try to then get Thurgood arraigned for, so but they don't actually turn him over, they, they turn back around and go to the city. And then they try to, to um, arrest him for drunk driving. Judge looks at him and said, this man's not true. Come on, y'all. Dismissed, let him go. But in that one moment, you in fact see so much about the role of law enforcement in the South that doesn't enforce the law. Another strain of law enforcement is like, mm, come on, y'all. There's some element of the Constitution we have to uphold. So you're looking at this really contested terrain, and in the middle of this contested terrain, you have African Americans who refuse to go into their place, who refuse to just stand there and take it, and who refuse to just abide by the old ways because they're like, no, this is a new day. And it's that new day that I think really is emblematic of the race riot in Columbia, Tennessee.